All right, so now moving on then into Blake's uh, very great uh, poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Now this was um, written in 1790 when Blake was 33 years old, uh, which he points out, which is of course significant because that's the age that Christ was when he was crucified. Um, and the book itself is sort of a satire on Emanuel Swedenborg's uh, book, Heaven and Hell, uh, which he wrote in, uh, he was a Swedish mystic, and he wrote that in 1757, the year that Blake was born, 57-58, it's right in there. And so Blake sees himself as, um, basically what he's doing is rejecting Swedenborg's um, dualism, the engine, the difference engine that he sets up, which powers his cosmology between an absolute heaven, heaven equals good, and an absolute hell, hell equals bad, um, Blake's going to marry those two. So this is a very deliberate, intentional inversion of con contraries. As he calls it, without contraries, there is no progression. Um, everything is necessary. Hell is just as necessary as heaven is. And in a way, he turns them upside down, and hell becomes heaven, and heaven becomes hell. So it's almost a kind of Nietzschean uh, revaluation of, of values. Um, and so this is the title page here. And we see, note that um, uh, there's a lot of sex going on here. Um, because for Blake, part of the, one of the problems with Christianity is its devaluation of the senses, and its devaluation of the genitals and the body. All of that equals hell. Uh, people who are having sex are uh, condemned by Christianity, especially if it's out of uh, outside the context of marriage. And so note that the couple on the bottom, this is a, a lesbian couple here uh, getting it on. We have various couples floating up from hell uh, doing all kinds of sex acts. Uh, we have couples strolling over here. Not sure what's going on over here, um, but as we will see, the senses for Blake are a, a primary form of experience, not just as they are for shallow philosophies like John Locke's or uh, Francis Bacon's and the sciences, where they become res restrictions, they get in the way. Here, Blake is celebrating the senses uh, in a different way. They are instruments of experience, and it is experience, energy, as he calls it, uh, that is the key thing. Um, and so here's the, uh, the argument page, which gives a brief uh, sort of synopsis. And we see here on the page, a woman um, is being lifted up into a tree. It looks like by another woman. It's hard to tell. And then so the argument goes, Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. That is to say they hang on the deep. Rintra is actually his first mythological character. Um, but he doesn't flesh him out. Uh, he will make a few more appearances subsequently, but he never really becomes one of his major characters. But he's pointing. He's on the way toward uh, Blake's creation of his cosmology. Here he just represents a, a principle of anger and wrath. And then he says, Once meek and in a perilous path, the just man kept his course along the vale of death. Roses are planted where thorns grow, and on the barren heath sing the honeybees. So once upon a time, then, we have this sort of uh, Christian pilgrim, like uh, the character in Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress, who is a just man, uh, going along a difficult path, but his path is going to trade places with the villain's path in a second here. He says, Then the perilous path was planted, and a river, and a spring on every cliff and tomb, and on the bleached bones red clay brought forth, the bleached bones are, of course, a reference to Ezekiel um, with all the, the value of bones that he sees and imagines them being reassembled and reliving. And, of course, red clay means the name of Adam. Um, Till the villain left the paths of ease. So the villain that we normally revile and uh, who goes along the easy path, whereas the just man goes along the difficult path, here um, Blake's going to have them trade places. So the villain left the paths of ease to walk in perilous paths and drive the just man into barren climes. Now the sneaking serpent walks in mild humility. Um, so this is the sneaking serpent is, of course, the, the villain. Uh, but now he is walking the path of meekness and humility, whereas the just man, as he says here, and the just man rages in the wilds where lions roam. So they've traded places. Um, 
And then it concludes, full circle, Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air, hungry clouds swag on the deep. Um, all right then. So that's the argument, the thesis, as it were. And now note too that Blake's art, uh, certainly by contrast with what we just looked at in the first video with All Religions Are One, uh, is quite a bit better. It's in color now, uh, but it's nothing like what it's going to be. And as we will see over time, the images will actually become larger and larger and larger till they completely shove the text off the page so that you have full, eventually he'll have full pages of very beautiful images. Blake's art gets better and better and his poetry gets better and better as he goes along. And so then um, he says on this page, as a new heaven is begun, and it is now 33 years since its advent, he's 33 years old when he's writing this, the eternal hell revives. And lo, Swedenborg is the angel sitting at the tomb. His writings are the linen clothes folded up. So we recall that at the end of the Gospels, they go back to check the tomb. Christ is gone, uh, and there's an angel in there, uh, a man in white. Um, and those that is now Swedenborg. Now is the dominion of Edom, which also means red, the red one, and the return of Adam into paradise. See Isaiah 34 and 35, chapter. Um, then he says, okay, without contraries is no progression. So you can't get anywhere by condemning half the world, by condemning the senses, the genitals. Christianity is a genitalist religion. That's a fact. Uh, it has made a mistake in regarding sexuality as something that is sinful, fallen, and forbidden. Um, and that's what Blake, one of the things, anyways, that he wants to bring to your attention here, that um, this is a revaluation of values. So hell is just as necessary as heaven is. They're both necessary. Um, as he says here, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. Hate is just as necessary as love. You wouldn't know what love was if you didn't have the experience of hatred. Um, from these contraries, he says, spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven, evil is hell. Uh, or so we're told to believe. For him, energy, um, he identifies evil with the principle of energy, kind of the way that his favorite poet Milton does in Paradise Lost with Satan. where he has, Satan is basically the main character and the hero of Paradise Lost, and he upstages everyone. Um, he, you, you identify with Satan. Nobody cares about virtuous characters uh, like Christ. Uh, uninteresting, boring. All right, let's move on to the next page here. Um, that's why when people read Dante, they only read the Hell Book, Inferno. Nobody reads Purgatory and Paradiso. I've read them, but... Um, most people do not. Who cares? Saints in various arrangements of light in uh, the Paradiso. Boring. Everybody wants the dirt in, in the Inferno. That's where all the, the scandals are. Okay, so here we have uh, the voice of the devil. So this is the devil now speaking, and he says, All Bibles or sacred codes have been the causes of the following errors. One, that man has two real existing principles, viz. a body and a soul. Two, that energy, called evil, is alone from the body, and that reason, called good, is alone from the soul. Three, that God will torment man in eternity for following his energies, which are associated with the body and which are evil. He says, but the following contraries to these are true. One, man has no body distinct from his soul, for that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. And two, energy is the only life and is from the body, and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Three, energy is eternal delight, and so nobody, God does not condemn people for following their energ energetic impulses. Energy is the primary thing. You have desires for a reason. They're meant to be acted on and followed, whereas Christianity tries to crush every natural urge and impulse as sinful. Blake says, those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained. <laughs> I love that. And the restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling. And being restrained, it by degrees becomes passive till it is only the shadow of desire. Um, the history of this is written in Paradise Lost, and the governor or reason is called Messiah. 
And the original archangel or possessor, or possessor of the command of the heavenly host is called the devil or Satan, and his children are called sin and death. But in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan. Um, right, so for this history has been uh, adopted by both parties. It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out, but the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. Uh, all right, so let's see. Here. Looks like we're moving along on these pages. These sites are very awkward and they're badly organized. These aren't even in chronological sequence here. So this was uh, page five, which shows the fall. Um, Paradise Lost opens book one with the fall of the rebel angels. Uh, perhaps we'll do a series on uh, Paradise Lost as well. And then so we're up to six here. which is nowhere to be found. Um, now here it is. I have no idea why these are not chronological. Very badly organized. Um, okay, so with six, uh, this is shown in the gospel, he says, where he prays to the Father to send the Comforter. That's in the John gospel when Christ says that the paraclete will, will be sent. And that's a very ambiguous and mysterious passage. Various individuals throughout history, such as the prophet uh, Mani, portrayed himself as the incarnation of the paraclete. Um, that reason may have ideas to build on, the Jehovah of the Bible being no other than he who dwells in flaming fire. That is a reference, of course, to Moses' ex experience of the burning bush. Note that after Christ's death, he became Jehovah. But in Milton, the Father is destiny, the Son a ratio of the five senses, and the Holy Ghost vacuum. The Holy Ghost pretty much does not appear in Paradise Lost, so it's a vacuum. Uh, and the Father, uh, Jehovah, represents destiny, and the Son is identified with the physical body. Note, he says, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty one of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet, and of the devil's party without knowing it. I think any reader of Paradise Lost would agree that uh, the, the true hero of that epic is definitely Satan. Uh, he's, he's a lot of fun. And so now he has this thing, a memorable fancy, which is a, a little uh, sojourn in hell. Uh, and this is what he finds. He says, as I was walking among the fires of hell. And so this echoes Dante's descent into hell, Milton's descent into hell, and so forth. As I was walking among the fires of hell, delighted with the enjoyments of genius, and notice, or rather, remember that uh, poetic genius in all religions are one, was, was his primary idea of the visionary faculty of the human being proper, which to angels look like torment and insanity. I collected some of their proverbs, thinking that as the sayings used in a nation mark its character, so the proverbs of hell show the nature of infernal wisdom better than any d description of buildings or garments. And so he's, these are all, this is a list of proverbs, which are sayings, um, his, Blake's sayings, which are deliberately meant to be uh, anti-Christian and overturning the established order of Christianity with its received values. When I came home on the abyss of the five senses where a flat-sided steep frowns over the present world, I saw a mighty devil folded in black clouds hovering on the sides of the rock with corroding fires. He wrote the following sentence, now perceived by the minds of men and read by them on earth. How do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by your senses five? Beautiful line there. Um, I believe it's an adaptation from a couple of lines from Thomas Chatterton, the romantic poet who killed himself at age 17 in uh, 1770, I believe. Um, that every And this is one of the main metaphysical ideas of Blake, that every single thing in the world is full of divine energy. Everything is infinite, not just God. We, we've inherited this tradition where we separate spirit above from nature below. Nature is fallen and corrupt and sinful. God is up above, God, the angels. Not so for Blake. This is a marriage of heaven and hell. The metaphysical is bound up with and entangled in the physical for Blake. The physical is a manifestation of the metaphysical, just as the body is a manifestation of the soul and whatever its desires or tendencies are. Um, and then so here we have the uh, Proverbs of Hell, 
on page 9 if I can find it here. Blake absolutely should be read with his illustrations because it's not the same experience if you don't. And there's a tactile quality to reading his uh, illuminated pages. Um, very sensual, very tactile. And that's part of Blake's point is to bring the senses in. He always wants to bring you down to the concrete world and find the divine there. So he says, In seed time learn and harvest teach and winter enjoy. Drive your cart and your plow over the bones of the dead. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. And so, for, uh, which I am 100% in, in agreement with, um, life should be lived excessively or you don't learn anything and you sure as hell won't enjoy anything if you don't. Um, excess, there's no golden mean here. Uh, everything in moderation. Uh, Blake says, no, 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 no. Forget what you've been taught by the conventions of your society and civilization. That's nonsense. Excess, um, you know, will take you places. You'll learn from it. Prudence is a rich, ugly old maid courted by incapacity. He <laughs> Prudence is a rich, ugly old maid courted by incapacity. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. You're supposed to act on your desires, Blake is saying. That's why you have them. Um, the cut worm forgives the plow. Dip him in the river who loves water. A fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. Right. So a wise man looks at a tree uh, and sees one thing. Like, say, Goethe will look at a tree and see the Urpflanza within it. The fool will look at a tree to totally differently. So, in other words, perception is reality um, for Blake. He whose face gives no light shall never become a star. Eternity is in love with the productions of time. That's why we have time. That's why we have a physical world, because it has deliberately been created as a place of enjoyment by the gods. The busy bee has no time for sorrow. The hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom, no clock can measure. All wholesome food is caught without a net or a trap. Bring out number, weight, and measure in a year of dearth. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. Um, that's important. Um, like Luther's uh, saying, sin bravely. If you're in a sin, do it your way and do it bravely because it's yours. You own it. A dead body revenges, not injuries. Uh, the most sublime act is to set another before you. If the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. Folly is the cloak of knavery. Shame is pride's cloak. Prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. <laughs> we wouldn't have brothels uh, if we didn't have uh, the, the, the shame of, of, of the priest um, saying that they're sinful. That's why they're there. They're there for a reason. The pride of the peacock is the glory of God. The lust of the goat is the bounty of God. The wrath of the lion is the wisdom of God. The nakedness of woman is the work of God. <laughs> you got that one right. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, let's see where we're at here. We're supposed to be on page eight. Um, right. So, excess of sorrow, laughs. Excess of joy, weeps. There again, the road to wisdom lies along the path of excess. Um, eventually, opposites, when they are pushed far enough, is Blake's point, they flip over into their opposite. Um, the roaring of lions, the howling of wolves, the raging of the stormy sea, and the destructive sword are portions of eternity too great for the eye of man. And so, as he'll say later, the doors of perception need to be cleansed. If they were cleansed, then we would see everything as it is, namely a manifestation of the infinite, of the divine, of God's energy, of God. The fox condemn, condemns the trap, not himself. Joys impregnate, sorrows bring forth. Let man wear the fell of the lion, woman the fleece of the sheep, the bird a nest, the spider a web, man friendship. The selfish smiling fool and the sullen frowning fool shall be both thought wise, that they may be a rod. What is now proved was once only imagined, the rat, the mouse, the fox, the rabbit watch the roots. The lion, the tiger, the horse, the elephant watch the fruits. The cistern contains, the fountain overflows. One thought fills immensity. Always be ready to speak your mind and a base man will avoid you. Everything possible to be believed is an image of truth. The eagle never lost so much time as when he submitted to learn of the crow. He should have been an eagle. Don't submit to the crow. The fox provides for himself, but God provides for the lion. 
Think in the morning, act in the noon, eat in the evening, sleep in the night. He who has suffered you to impose on him knows you. As the plow follows words, so God rewards prayers. The tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Expect poison from the standing water. You never know what is enough unless you know what is more than enough. Listen to the fool's reproach. It is a kingly title. The eyes of fire, the nostrils of air, the mouth of water, the beard of earth. The weak in courage is strong and cunning. The apple tree never asks the beech how he shall grow, nor the lion the horse how he shall take his prey. The thankful receiver bears a plentiful harvest. If others had not been foolish, we should be so. The soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. When thou seest an eagle, thou seest a portion of genius. Lift up thy head. As the caterpillar chooses the fairest leaves to lay her eggs on, so the priest lays his curse on the fairest joys, because he has renounced them. He can't have them, and so he condemns in others what he has denied himself to participate in. To create a little flower is the labor of ages. Dam braces, bless relaxes. The best wine is the oldest, the best water the newest. Prayers plow not, praises reap not, joys laugh not, sorrows weep not. All right, so let's see, now we're up to page 10 here. Um, <clears throat> okay, we got a little image here of him in hell. I think these are uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah to either side of him. And he says, uh, the head, sublime. The heart, pathos. The genitals, beauty. The hands and feet, proportion. As the air to a bird or the sea to a fish, so is contempt to the contemptible. The crow wished everything was black. The owl, that everything was white. Exuberance is beauty. If the lion was advised by the fox, he would be cunning. Improvement makes straight roads, but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. You want to go down the crooked road, because that's how you learn. Um, and your own road should be the crookedest road imaginable. If you're on a straight road, you're on someone else's path that's been pre-digested, pre-designed for you, and you're, you're going to learn nothing. Um, sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. Otherwise, you wind up with a life of regrets. Oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have acted on this impulse. Should have acted on that one. Where man is not, nature is barren. Truth can never be told so as to be understood and not be believed. Enough? or too much. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses. And I think this brings us to page 11. I just want to do the first half in this video. 11. <clears throat> and um, so the ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, Lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly, they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity, till a system was formed which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood. Um, and so, as he'll establish later, religion is a defense against having a religious experience. That is exactly what it is. What you wind up with in formal religion is a bunch of stiffened, stale, dead, dried dogma and concepts that are uh, that are just blockages, and they will block you from having properly spiritual experiences. Um, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales, and at length they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Um, and then we have another memorable uh, fancy here on... Uh, page 12. We're just going to go up to 14 here. So page 12. Um, another memorable fancy this time he dines with um, in hell with Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, sort of like the symposium in Plato. Um, the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel dined with me and I asked them how they dared so roundly to assert uh, that spoke God to, that God spoke to them and whether they did not think at the time that they would be misunderstood and so be the cause of imposition. Isaiah answered, I saw no God, nor heard any in a finite organical perception, but my senses discovered the infinite in everything. 
And as I was then persuaded and remained confirmed that the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God, I cared not for consequences, but wrote. Then I asked, does a firm persuasion that a thing is so make it so? He replied, all poets believe that it does. And in ages of imagination, this firm persuasion removed mountains, but many are not capable of a firm persuasion of anything. And so perception is reality. It really is. What you see is what you get. Then Ezekiel said, the philosophy of the East taught the first principles of human perception. Some nations held one principle for the origin and some another. We of Israel taught that the poetic genius, as you now call it, was the first principle, and all the others merely derivative, which was the cause of our despising the priests and philosophers of other countries, and prophesying that all gods would at last be proved to originate in ours, and to be the tributaries of the poetic genius. Um, this brings us to page 13. If I can find it here. Uh, there we go. 13. And um, it was this that our great poet King David desired so fervently and invoked so pathetically, saying by this he conquers enemies and governs kingdoms. And we so loved our God that we cursed in his name all the deities of surrounding nations and asserted that they had rebelled. From these opinions, the vulgar came to think that all nations would at last be subject to the Jews. This, said he, like all firm persuasions, is come to pass. For all nations believe the Jews' code and worship the Jews' God, and what greater subjection can be? I heard this with some wonder and must confess my own conviction. After dinner, I asked Isaiah to favor the world with his lost works. He said none of equal value was lost. Ezekiel said the same of his. I also asked Isaiah what made him go naked and barefoot three years. He answered, the same that made our friend Diogenes, the Grecian. Diogenes was the Greek philosopher who renounced all possessions and went and lived to, to live in a barrel for a while. I then asked Ezekiel why he eat dung and lay so long on his right and left side. He answered, the desire of raising other men into a perception of the infinite. This the North American tribes practice, and is he honest who resists his genius or conscience only for the sake of present ease or gratification? Um, so Blake believed that the Native Americans had uh, the true religion, the, the nature as something that is filled with the divine with divine energy. Um, and then finally for th this video, uh, page 14, which brings us pretty much to the halfway point of this masterpiece, where he says, the ancient tradition that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of 6,000 years is true, as I have heard from hell. And so there's this, there was this Christian idea that the world was created in 4004 BC. And in a certain sense it was, because that's about the time when the first cities come into being in Mesopotamia, the Sumerian cities, 3,500-ish, um, in that there would be 2,000 more years, and that each one of these six, uh, 6,000 years is a day of God, which is meant then to replicate his six days of creation, and then the Sabbath, where he rests on the Sabbath, will be the second coming of Christ and the millennium. So he says, For the cherub with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at the tree of life, and when he does, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment, especially from the arts. Uh, the improvement of the sensual enjoyment comes through, through the arts. Um, but first, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. In a way, this is true, and in a way, it is not. Uh, um, Yes, the, the body is a physical manifestation of the soul and its temperament, uh, its karmic uh, desires and issues, tendencies, perceptions. They are all made physically manifest in a particular body that the soul has indeed chosen uh, as the outer manifestation of it. But it's also separate from the body in that uh, once that body dies, the soul does not die, but it transmigrates uh, to the other side and then reincarnates. And so... It's true and not true at the same time. This I shall do by printing in the infernal method by corrosives, which in hell are salutary and medicinal, melting apparent surfaces away and displaying the infinite which was hid. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And so that's Plato's myth of the cave, which he interweaves uh, all through his poetry, uh, that the cave 
is the cave of the senses, which encloses us up into this narrow cavern. And in order to find the forms, the ideas, or let's say the metaphysical or spiritual dimension, you have to leave the cavern, leave the, the world of sensible, what Plato calls sensible particulars, um, illusions first, then sensible particulars, and rise through the study of intelligible particulars, that is to say mathematics, especially geometry, to disengage the mind from the senses and to realize that it can access a higher world, a metaphysical world, um, and then move on up into the purely metaphysical world of the forms. Um, and then so Blake retains this myth, uh, Plato's myth, all through his work here. All right, so we're halfway through the marriage of uh, heaven and hell.